Good afternoon, everyone. I call the uh, October, December 8th, 2022 Jacksonville Water and Sewer Advisory Committee meeting at to order. Uh, Mr. Vice, do we have a quorum? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, have we had a chance to uh, review the agenda items? We have. Are there any discussions? Hearing none, I will accept the motion to adopt the agenda. A motion we adopt the agenda. Okay, second? Second. Second. Okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Agenda adopted. Have you had a chance to review the last uh, October meeting's minutes? Yes. Are there any omissions or corrections? All right, hearing none, I will accept the motion to accept the minutes as written. A motion we accept the minutes as written. All right, second. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Minutes approved. Uh, we'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, on one of the last meetings of the year, and I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Sabrina Adams. Uh, they'll be one of our briefers. Uh, and now I'll just turn it over to Mr. Hanson. Good evening. We appreciate everybody coming tonight. Tonight, uh, Sabrina Adams, who's our finance director, is going to give us a kind of brief overview for uh, all things related to finance and budgeting for water and sewer. Um, as you know, we focus on water and sewer for this committee, so she'll be talking about um, the things that go into budgeting and funding for water and sewer related activities. And I'd also like to introduce Ms. Solante. She is our assistant, deputy or assistant, I'm sorry. Deputy. Deputy. She's our deputy finance director, and she comes to us uh, by way of Maysville. So um, we'd like to welcome her also. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sabrina. All right. Thank you all for having me here tonight. I'm just going to do a very basic overview of the water and sewer finance, um, how the fund is uh, funded, and the budgeting process, um, how we get to determine the expenditures and the fees and, and um, that sort of thing. So the water sewer fund is an enterprise fund, which means that it is run like a business, really. The user fees or the revenues that are in the fund are the fees that support the ex expenditures. There's no general fund money that comes into the water sewer fund to fund operations. Um, sales tax, property tax, that's part of the general fund, but that, that money, that revenue stream does not come into the water sewer. So it's strictly funded by fees that are collected within the fund. For that funding, we have the largest part is our monthly rates, our user fees, um, which is consists of our base rate and our volume charge. And then we have the system development fees, which actually um, can only be used for growth and development related items. They are actually put into a capital reserve fund and specifically used for capital projects that support growth and development. We have some supplemental revenue sources the logging, which um, we do timber sales. We sell timber from the land application site. And we have cellular lease agreements on, I think all of our water towers at this point. Mm -hmm. Most of them, maybe. <clears throat> we have a lot of them. It's a significant amount of revenue that we generate. And then um, we do some grants in the water sewer fund as well. Especially with the ARPA funding we've received um, some large amounts of money from that, which we'll mention a little bit later. What is ARPA? American Rescue Plan. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into the rate model discussion. So just an overview of our budget process. We kick off our budget every year in November, which seems crazy because we don't actually adopt a budget until June, but we've actually already had our kickoff meetings with staff. During the budget process, finance does make some assumptions. We make some assumptions on um, expenditures like uh, electricity bills, insurance, uh, salaries, things like that. Um, we take into consideration forecasts from fleet uh, as far as the price of fuel, what vehicles and equipment need to be replaced, um, 
FLEA does have an equipment repla replacement plan. So that I believe is five years um, of equipment and vehicles that they're looking at. So that's all taken into consideration as well. Then we receive requests from each of the departments or um, divisions within water sewer. So, you know, uh, we have utilities maintenance and uh, wastewater and metering and all of those divisions are providing, sending in their department request. Then um, between the time we get the department requests and the time the budget's approved in June, of course, we, there's meetings with the manager where decisions are made. And then we have council workshops and we finally get to the final adopted budget in June. And we are required to have the budget adopted by June 30th by North Carolina law. And the budget starts one July? Yes. <coughs> so it runs from July 1st through June 30th every year. So within our budget, we have some different sort of major pieces of the budget. We have our operations and maintenance, and that would include all of our personnel, our equipment, materials, like the chemicals for the water plants, any supplies, things like that, that are used to in operations. And then our fuel cost, and we also have our annual contracts. So any type of software maintenance or maintenance on equipment, um, water tower maintenance, things of that nature are included in that. Software. <coughs> And then the capital projects. So we start that process in about the October timeframe. Uh, Wally does a call for capital projects, but um, they are, his team is out trying to identify what infrastructure needs to be replaced, as well as think about the projected growth and look at those every year and try to determine what capital projects need to be in the CIP, which is a 10 year document. Um, and so that is also adopted in conjunction with the budget or sort of with the budget process because the CIP that we fund in the in that fiscal year is part of our budget as well. So if that makes sense, we only fund one year at a time, even though we have 10 years in the capital improvement plan. And then a, a huge part of the water sewer budget um, is our rate calculation and our model. We have a rate model that is really a giant spreadsheet with a whole lot of tabs. Um, a lot of information goes into it and it helps us determine if our rates are where we need to be to fund the water sewer operations. Because as we talked about, that's really what, I mean, we have to use those funds to um, to pay the expenses. So within that rate model, we are including everything from our CIP, our operations and maintenance cost, all of our revenues go into there, our budget, our current budget, and then it projects out future years as well based on um, different factors that we build in. It considers the water and sewer fund balance that we currently have. And once we determine the rate, those rates do have to be approved every year by council. That's part of the fee schedule, which again is part of our budget process. And typically council has had a policy of doing a 2.25% increase because um, that's what the rate model had historically showed was a good idea to do. However, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, we did not have a rate increase at all um, for this year because of some uh, ARPA money that we received. Yeah annual increase was something this board recommended yes. uh, to council through Wally. So it's something that the board is guilty of as much as anybody, but we found that there was things that would happen if we didn't have some sort of increase. And we had a, a three year period where the rates went up 26% on average in three years, which caused an outcry. Uh, if I may interrupt on another subject uh, dealing with this, Wally, we had a model designed and built by a contractor years ago, if yes. you recall, which caused a lot of conversation. Is this the same um, model? Uh, it is. Or, or do we, will we update that? Since I'm assuming most people don't remember the contractor or the conversation that went into. 
So we had, we did have an outside consultant develop the model for us. It's the model that we continue to operate. And they, they trained us in, um, actually Sabrina maintains the model. So um, all of the factors and formulas and everything's there. She inputs all of the information and it's based on historic, historical data and then what we forecast for the upcoming years. So it's the, it is the same model. And I think she's actually got some slides in here of it. So she'll talk about that in a few minutes. It's been in place for a number of years. We don't think we need to plan in the next five years to have that model redone uh, with better scientific approach or? Um, we've talked at a staff level about when it would be appropriate to um, have another consultant come in and evaluate. And some of that we've looked at doing as part of the Western Regional uh, Sewer System Project, uh, primarily if we would have to go out and issue bonds for that project. So you would have to do an analysis anyway as part of that issuance. So the thought is if we do that, then it would make sense to tie that all together and only do it once. And when do you think that would be? Um, we're waiting on approvals for that project now, so. 2025? I, maybe, I don't know yet. Okay, no, excuse my interruption. Oh, that's fine. And I was gonna say that that is a really great thing about our rate model is that although it was developed <clears throat> by a consultant, um, we did have a rate model previous to this one, but this one, while a lot of work, it is a little bit easier to navigate as a staff and also the consultant, we can still reach out to them if we do have a question. And a great example of that is when we did uh, receive that additional ARPA funding, there was a question about where, how exactly does that fit into the model because we didn't have that before. So we were able to contact them and sort of talk through that. So it, it's been a great model, but I do agree that in the next, like Wally said, if we do go out for revenue bonds, we will be required to do a feasibility study, and usually you would do the water, the rate model study at the same time. And we have not started the rate model yet for the FY24 budget, but I did want to just show you a little bit about what we did to get to FY23. So we, as we're going through and trying to determine the rates, we key those expenditures in that have been requested at the department level even though they may not have been approved by council yet because we're doing this prior to that. We're trying to get a good estimate of where we are expenditure wise. And then we do escalate expenses, like I mentioned earlier, anywhere between one and a half to 5%, just depending on what we're looking at, if it's electricity or fuel or employee salaries. And then we are very conservative in our growth um, projections and as of the FY23 model, we did increase the meters. Um, we just project at 100 per year, and that's been a, kind of consistent for the last few years. Does that distinguish what type of meters? The rate model does, yes. Okay. Um, I, I didn't list it in here, but it does calculate in the different sizes. And Some of the, the people that rates. are watching this on the G10 might not know that they have a meter, but it's not the same meter that's used at the hospital. Right. We definitely, we have meter sizes from five eighths inch to six inch, and they are very different in base rate and the volume of water that are used. So that is a great point. Most households have the uh, five eighths or three quarter size meter. So that is the majority of them. But the rate model does take mm -hmm. into account each of the different sizes and those volume rates. We have been projecting uh, water usage growth at zero. Again, we are just very conservative with our projections. Um, usage has not really gone up much through the years, even when we are adding meters. Uh, people tend to be, it seems, more conservative. Um, lately, uh, there's more energy efficient appliances and um, also, I don't know how many years it's been now, but quite a few years ago, we. Uh, established a tiered rate system. So the higher, the more water that you use, the higher your rate becomes. And so that also curbs um, some extra usage, I think. If I could footnote that, again, the board was a 
party to that conversation and, and had a lot of opinion about what that tiering of water should be. And uh, so, again, we have that ability to influence things in that regard. And then within the model, we enter all of our CIP projects that we have proposed. Um, those projects go out through 2033, or they will with the FY24 proposed CIP. And another great thing about the rate model is that Wally and I can sit down together and we can move projects. He may look, have his CIP initially and have projects in one year, and we can look at what it does to the rate model, to the fund balance, to the rates, and we can shift things from year to year, so it's a great tool for him as well um, to determine you know, when might be best to plan a project. And then, as of right now, we do have included $29 million in state and ARPA funding um, for the Parkwood Regional Project. Previously, we did not have that in the model. Um, we did not have that funding, and we were going to have to take revenue bonds for all of that, so that has been um, tremendous. <laughs> as far as our rate model and the reason that we were able to not have rate increases this year. Is that a recent funding? Mm -hmm. I don't remember hearing about it before, if y'all. Michael Zara got it from the state. Okay. Mm -hmm. 20 Good. And Great. 20 at least. I think yeah. the last meeting was the first time it was discussed in the board. It was discussed as part of the, <clears throat> when we discussed the CIP last year, it was part of that discussion. So it was kind of buried into that because it was applied to that project. So that may be why it doesn't stand out because it was, the discussion was brought and buried into the financing of the Western Regional Project. And we've probably had a dozen updates over the years of that project. So that's probably why it doesn't stand out. Renamed as well. Yeah, so, so that, that project. It has several names. That project's been on the CIP forever, so it's, I know since I've been here, it's changed names through two or three times. So. But that's also helped keep the taxes down and the bills going up for the, for the citizens out there. And these slides I just wanted to include to give you some general information about our water and sewer meter um, count as we're talking about that our meters, our number of meters does not increase significantly and our usage um, but you can see that we, at, because we have the rate increases each year, the revenue does increase, but we don't have a ton of growth in our meter count. Um, and our volume, I mean, it kind of even goes up and down a little bit as well. But this is our estimate for 2023 for our number of meters we have right now ending the year at um, 22,561. This is not the same as the number of accounts, which we sometimes get confused. But our meters, um, when we are talking about the rate model for the purposes of estimating revenue and volume, we may have a two-inch meter on an apartment complex that serves six units. Those, for the purposes of the rate model, are counted as six because the way that we bill a multi-unit is not, this may be too much information, but we don't bill for a two-inch meter. We bill for six five-eighths inch meters. So when we say that this is how many meters we have that's for the purposes of equivalent meters if that makes sense so we're it's billing on a eru an equivalent residential unit mm -hmm. i just like to clarify that because sometimes it gets confused with the number of customers that we have so we don't we stopped allowing master meters anymore right we don't really do we issue for we do for commercial and it's not actually called a master meter, it's called a multi-user or multi-tenant meter or something. But for apartment complexes, we stopped allowing master metering. That's correct. Um, and really, city council is the only one that could approve a master meter request. Staff couldn't do that even when we were allowing them. And um, somewhere in 2000, seven or eight, I believe, we went through a water shortage and we had a high, there was high pressure on apartments at that time. And um, the staff at the time, along with the leadership and council decided that, you know, if, if we were really going to worry about water usage and consumption, people needed to know what they were using. 
So if you have an apartment complex that everything's buried into one, one large meter with one bill that goes to somebody that handles that, then the user is never accountable for the water they're actually using. So uh, council actually turned down two requests right at about the same time. And since then, we've had a few people, few few developers come in and mention it and say they'd like to request it. And when we tell them the history, they typically just kind of back off. But if somebody were to request it, it would still have to go to city council for approval. One of the things with this particular chart that I would uh, warn against is there's a missing component. So you can't relate volume to revenue because even when your volume goes down, the cost to produce it goes up. And so somebody might look at that and say, well, gee, you're getting more for a lesser volume generated. Yes, but what's missing is what it costs per gallon to do that, whether it's the health insurance for employees or it's a chemicals or it's electricity. So yes, that gives us a sense, but you can't relate volume to revenue directly. That's a great example because chemicals alone in the last like 18 months is over 60% above what we were buying them in 2000 and 20, 60%. And it had gone up pretty significantly all along that time period. But in, in 18 months, it went up 60%. And they get harder. They're, they're becoming harder to get um, and less manufacturers. So it's um, the chemical piece is interesting. Materials in general are difficult right now, but chemicals are specifically difficult. And I was actually going, I was thinking about chemicals as well because I think I just saw something this past week on it, but um, I was going to point out that exact thing that while the revenue, our revenue is increasing, but if you look at how much it is increasing from year to year, you know, from 22 to 23, it's not a great amount. We didn't have a big rate increase or any rate increase at all. We didn't add that many more meters, but, and we haven't looked at expenses yet because we're not that far into the budget, but I'm sure that when we do, we will see that the expenditures have increased much more significantly than our revenues have. Just between, like Wally said, the chemicals, the salaries, the cost of the vehicles, everything is more. Based on what you just said, and I got a simple mind, but with the cost going up in the chemicals and the revenue and all that, why wouldn't there have been an increase? You said 0% for this next coming year. Wouldn't you anticipate that you're going to have to raise uh, 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 based on what you just said? Well, we haven't gotten into what we will see in for 2024. But in 2023, the model supported <clears throat> that we didn't need to do a rate increase. So, and that over the, the model isn't just one year. It actually looks like at a 10 year period. So what it showed is there was an impact for not having a rate increase over the 10 year period, but not such to the point where it, it was a detriment to the revenue stream. Probably. So even with planned, even with material costs and things <coughs> escalating, it still it, it still didn't show that that increase would have a significant impact. I think one of the main things was the model naturally included the full bearing the full cost of the big expansion. It did that has come off our back. Yes. The 20 okay. some million. Oh, that yes. Has, it's definitely changed the equation. Absolutely. Because that's that's over half the project okay. being paid for. Yeah, well, that makes sense then. The, the other thing to take note was before the zero, we had increased by this board's recommendation 2% each year, even though the cost hadn't gone up 2% each year, so that it kind of gave us a cushion. That's right. So the fact that we were doing the 2%. And got that zero is exactly why that debate in this board was so significant in saying, listen, instead of having a 25% increase, if we do a little bit, even if the costs don't go up that much, the year that it does go up, we'll be covered. We'll have that money. 
So this slide is um, the same slide, but for the sewer, <coughs> we have a different number for sewer meters because we have a different number of customers. We have some customers that are water only and some that are sewer only. So those numbers aren't always exactly the same. And then we can talk, we can actually see one of the, this is the panel that comes at the end of the rate model that we typically present after we put all the information in. This is the panel that we had for FY23. Keeping in mind that we, this is only one of the panels and we run a lot of different scenarios to show, um, but I think this is where we ended up. Um, last year, for FY23, council decided no rate increase and I don't know what the decision will be for 24, but it was discussed uh, with the information that we had last year, possibly a 1.25% for 24, and then back to the 2.25. I'm gonna take my glasses off so I can see my paper here. I can't, those, oh, they're, 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 they're too. Um, so the way the rate model works is that the, the very top line is where it says override, that's where we key in. Um, the amount that we we want to see what it does but if you look at the green that is what we call the just in time rate increase so that is telling us with the things that are in the model right now with the projects and the ARPA funding and the expenditures and the revenues that we have that's where we would need the rate increases so you could see that for 23 when we um, showed that the rate model showed that we really didn't need an increase until 2025. But if you continue to look out into off years, you can see again, we're creeping up to those big rate increases that you spoke of earlier. So by keeping, by doing the 1.25 and then going back to the 2.25, we're keeping um, things nice and even, so to speak. And while we're keeping our, maintaining our fund balance and not having any big rate increases, and then at the very bottom, that's just showing that you can see what the average water sewer bill is for 6,000 gallons. So that when you're looking at that, you can see what that actually means for a customer. And it might be pointed out that the base rate is 5,000 gallons. So at 6,000, you'd be going to the, it's two, yeah, I'm sorry. But at, at some point you have a base that's in the, and then the 6,000 takes you up. So that's why it would be. Right. $88 vice the 70 we're paying today. Yeah. And as part of the rate model, there's that, that panel. And then this is another one that we look at that's very important because we are um, trying to always look ahead to our fund balance. Spending down fund balance can be okay, but you definitely have a target. And our target is um, that black line there. And when we ran this last year, you could see um, what our fund balance looked like for that specific scenario. So everything looked, you know, nice and healthy way above the target. But if you start modifying the rates and changing it, that's when you can see you're spinning down your fund balance and dropping below that black line, which we try to avoid. And there are some other things that we look at as well. Um, their debt coverage ratios that we have to have for our, water, our revenue bonds. We can't drop below a certain amount for that. So we're taking that into consideration too, which is also another piece of the rate model panel. Can you explain what the fund balance is? That's just the money sitting in the bank or is that the re reserves required? What, what is the fund balance? What by definition? So the fund balance is uh, not necessarily just m money in the bank, but it's, you know, cash investments. It's, it's everything that we have that I actually have my last slide to show the unrestricted fund balance. Um, we do have restricted uh, for, I, I think that's pile bill probably in the mm -hmm. water sewer projects. Maybe. maybe. Um, so we do have some that is restricted. It could also be some encumbrances, the 1.5 million and then unrestricted is uh, 47. We ended FY22 at 47. Um, well, almost that was 48. money that wasn't needed. Right. Not com uh, committed to anything unrestricted money. It's money. But, but you could have some projects in there that you haven't fully right. executed. So really it could be, it's not restricted, but it could be committed. 
Um, but you could uncommit it because you could cancel that project. So that's why it's not restricted. Right. So, but so some of that forty-seven. It's not like there's forty-seven million dollars of cash sitting around. <laughs> But there are other things that go into that calculation that where it's not restricted. Um, I think this is important to understand because for most people, a fund balance is what we have in our checkbook after we wrote the last check. Yeah, and, that's, and that's not the concept here. This You're telling me that this amount of money was at the end of the year unused, even though you may have committed for it in the future. But right. because of that, you won't have to go out and get bonds or other revenue because you have this there. And your chart before was trying to show that the target shows you how much of that is okay to consider because you want to stay above that black line. Right. So and can we go back on to the black line? And so <coughs> one of the things that Sabrina pointed out is every year when we, we look at the capital projects that are in the capital improvement plan, which we are going to give you a brief overview of the capital improvement plan process tonight also, um, as we're kicking off the, the budget season, the, you know, as we sit down and we, we get our projects in and we do our best to kind of say, you know, we think this project should be here and this one here and this one here based on the information that we have. And then what we do is kind of adjust those projects um, within that 10 year plan. And admittedly, when we're doing that, while the black line is there, that's, you know, we want to be above that target. We still, we still work on adjusting to keep pushing that out every year. So, um, while it shows we're getting toward the end of that, toward that black line in 2032, what you'll see for next year is we'll end up pushing that out again. So the idea is that if we end up spending down some of our fund balance, we do it, but we do it very slowly. And I think if you go back four or five years, you'd see that, you know, we kind of we're headed there, but we never actually we're not going. It, you know that thirty thirty two date isn't what stays. It kind of keeps moving out. So that's the importance of having a good model and being able to um, appropriately prioritize our projects. And then the discussion comes of like the Western Regional Project. It's one of those projects that's been around for so long, but a good portion of that project is development driven also, which means you do get revenue back for that project to help cover that project from our system development fees as builders tie in. But when, you know, we went through a period where growth slowed a little bit and we weren't having the development pressure in that area. So we slowed that project. So some of that was a conscious decision to match what we were seeing with conditions, with actual um, market-driven conditions in the field. So um, all of this are important tools as we're budgeting because, you know, we don't want to drive up rates if we don't have to. Um, we, we try to um, keep rates because I'm, I'm a rate payer too. So, you know, I certainly don't want to see rates go up either. So we try to do a very good job of appropriately placing our projects and our, and our um, operational expenses to try to, you know, drive that out as far as we can. I think it does a good point to tell the rest of the board. They're really, it, we don't see the finance director very often. We saw more in the past, but there really is a hand in glove operation here especially when we start talking about the CIP and those of us on this board say, can you push that out so the rate doesn't go up and Wally can come back and tell us, hey, the model says the rate won't go up because this is being done or there is reserves for this or whatever, but Wally doesn't keep the books. He's got to go talk to the finance department and it's, like I said, it's a real hand in glove to make sure that the model is giving us what we want and of course 
we as a board want to make sure that the community doesn't have to pay more for water, but at the same time doesn't have the problems that other communities have had of failed water systems. That's really uh, my last slide was the fund balance. So if, you, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to try to answer. Thank you very much. All right. We appreciate that. It's very informative. And like uh, Mr. Thomas was talking about, there's a lot of information out there that you just mentioned that enables us to understand exactly how the coordination between you two are to making this thing work. Because the bottom line is, as a citizen, you're looking at why is my rates going up? Because they don't know all of this unless they see us on TV here. But uh, it's very important. We really appreciate that. And I'm happy to come back and talk about the right model once in yeah, more detail closer. once we get a little bit closer. Um, typically, we wait until we have the billing done in December so that we have a good six months. And then we start, you know, look, entering in the revenues and the usage and things like that. And then as we get, it takes a little bit longer to get the department request in. But once we get that done, I, I definitely come back and go over the right model. Uh, three things that you didn't talk about that maybe you'll talk about in the future, and that is mandatory reserves. You know, the state requires we have certain reserves in the enterprise fund, and the impact of bonds and uh, <clears throat> other things that we go after, because we have talked about that in the past, about how that's impact. Uh, if you have to go out, and maybe you go out and get it because it's at a 3%. <laughs> right now and you don't go out and get it when it's 20 percent but then that impacts on the reserves you've got to have because the state requires if you have bonds you have reserves that conversation uh, would be informative for people and we didn't do a very good job we kind of talked about our target as the black line but that is part of what sabrina's talking about is they they give you guidance on the percentage of operating budget which is kind of what you see there that's that black line. That's why it creeps up a little bit. Yeah, so, some of this is state mandated. I don't ever recall any federal mandates in the enterprise fund, but uh, you know, you can't just go out there and spend all your money without the state coming along and saying, wait a minute, you still have $150 million in bonds. Where's your reserve? Thank you. Thank you. So next, uh, next topic. Molly's got it, CIP clauses. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, we thought this would tie nicely to the last uh, topic. We're getting ready, as, as Sabrina mentioned, um, October and November uh, kind of kick off the budget process. Mm -hmm. We start with um, a call for new projects for our capital improvement plan. And while we're going to talk about water and sewer projects, that also includes every project that we do for recreation or the fire department or the police department or streets that we pave, um, buildings that need, uh, you know, new roofs or renovations or HVAC equipment or anything like that. So the, the capital improvement plan that we see, while there's a lot of water and sewer projects, there's also a lot of other projects in there as well. And um, public services and engineering manage that for the entire city. So tonight we're going to talk about water and sewer only, but the reason we start that process so early in the budget year uh, for the next budget year is because of how large the, the uh, capital improvement program really is. So with that, well, I know that some of you have seen this, but just kind of talk about what is the capital improvement plan. It's a, um, it's a document that gives us a 10 year planning horizon. Again, uh, largely used for water and sewer and the planning of those projects, but it also includes all of the parks and recreation projects we plan to do over the next 10 years. Um, along with any fire or police type projects that we need to do. Um, so it really captures all of the projects the city forecasts in the next 10 years. And that's mandated um, by the state. We used to do five years, right? So the, the only thing mandated by the state is if you have system development fees, if you charge system development fees, which are fees paid for new water and sewer connections, 
which would be when somebody, a, a builder builds a house, they pay a system development fee. It's, it, it's had many informal names over the years. People know them as impact fees, tap fees, those kind of things. But really the state says they are system development fees. There's legislation that says that. So um, if you charge system development fees, you have to have a capital improvement program. We had ours in place long before that legislation ever came into play. Um, and you're correct, it says 10 years. We had a five year at the time, so it made it pretty easy to go from five to 10. Because we're, um, while we have a 10 year document, I'll tell you we have probably 12 to 15 years of projects sitting out there. We take any project that we've identified in our model or our master plan um, using project projections that go out 30, 35 years. I'll be honest, my crystal ball is not that great. So it's based on the land that's out there. And I'll show you some kind of shots from our model in a few minutes to show you how we do that. Um, but once, once we identify those projects, we want to make sure that they don't, you know, they don't get overlooked or fall off the radar or anything like that. So we get them into the capital improvement plan software. Then it just becomes, it just shows you the 10 year window. So when we go to the next, you know, this year, when we go from 23 to, to 32 and we change that from to 24 to 33, we've already got projects sitting out there. Then it becomes a, an evaluation process. Do we include that or do we not? Um, and that way when, you know, hope never happens, I get hit by a bus, somebody behind me can say, oh, that project's sitting out there. Why is that project out there? Do we need to do anything with that project? Um, so we actually go longer than the 10 year window. It made it really easy for us when that state mandate came into play. It was state legislation that was put in place for the system development fees. Um, but that portion is tied. The, the rest of it is good planning practice for the city. You know, we're, we're for using recreation master plans. We're forecasting what we think we need um, and what the community desires. We're doing the same for the fire department. Fire station number four that council just awarded um, Tuesday night is part of the capital improvement plan. It's been in there for at least the last five or six years. So, you know, it's, it's not like that project just popped up overnight. So... We do a very good job of planning for the future. Um, along with that, as part of that planning, you want to identify the, the funding sources for projects. So we always look and try to identify those, those possible funding sources, whether it's um, you know water and sewer fund related or whether it's coming from the police department and it's, it's able to be funded by 911 funds or, or um, you know, part of the parks department and it's a part F grant. So we do identify funding sources. The primary, we'll talk about it in a minute, the primary funding sources that you see for water and sewer. Um, up until the ARPA funds, the previous grant funds we had were ARA, American Reinvestment Act funds. And that was 2009, right? 2009. So we really don't qualify for a lot of grant funds um, when we get grant funding for our water and sewer system, it's, um, you know, we try to take advantage of that, but it's not very frequent. So um, prior in the, that way, in the time that I've been here, I've been here since 2002 or three, in the time that I've been here, the ARA funds, um, which was the American Reinvestment Act of 2009, was the largest grant funds I had seen for water and sewer, and that was only $3 million. So the, the 20 million or the 28 million that we got really is a, a windfall for our water and sewer system. Um, and then we use the capital improvement plan um, to prioritize projects. As Sabrina said, you know, we look at, um, you know, our infrastructure, we try to prioritize <coughs> projects. And then we also try to um, fund them appropriately and put them in to where, you know, there, you don't have these huge spikes of, of projects all in one year. We try to spread those out and appropriate, appropriately plan those projects. Um, and then 
it also shows the expenditures for the project. So if we think, you know, the um, a great uh, example is the Parkwood or the Western Regional Sewer System project we've talked about a couple times tonight. You know, from start to finish, once we start construction, that is a about a four year project. Well, you're not going to expend all, you know, twenty eight million dollars in year one. That's going to be spread out. So we also try to predict the expenditures. Um, Before you leave that, we I'd like to have mentioned that the probable source also includes partnering with the state, whether it's DOT or some other project. So when they tear up a road, we, we may avoid that cost by fixing sewer or water lines and then they do the road again, we don't incur the cost for the road, for example. Correct. And Powell uh, money for certain things helps. Um, so there is partnerships that also go along with this. And when we do a project and somebody else is working in the same area, they may pay what we would have had to pay the cost for. That's correct. So uh, in the capital um, improvement plan, you have the individual projects. <clears throat> So to qualify to be in the capital improvement plan, a project has to exceed $50,000 in cost, have a five-year useful life, and it needs to take um, 12 months or more to complete. Um, and really what that does is it keeps things like equipment and vehicles and fleet out of your capital improvement plan and keeps those in a, an equipment replacement plan. So these are really capital investments that we're making in, um, for us, water and sewer infrastructure, but across the city in our buildings and our infrastructure. So you're really, you're talking capital assets is what you're talking about. Um, the type of projects that you see in the capital improvement plan um, for us includes water, sewer, uh, projects that have a combination of water and sewer, a great example of that. Um, is Brookview Drive, where we had to go in, and we talked about this, we had to replace 1,700 feet of um, sewer line, but our records show there was a separation between the water and the sewer, and when we actually dug it up, there wasn't. So that meant we had to go back and relocate our water line in order to complete that project. So we had a combination of water and sewer project there. Um, and then the, the other one that Mr. Nickel kind of mentioned is the, the projects that are impacted by NCDOT. If NCDOT is widening a roadway or doing um, intersections imp improvements in an area or stormwater improvements in an area, they oftentimes end up impacting our water or sewer lines that are under that roadway. So if DOT impacts our um, infrastructure, we are required to share in the cost of relocating um, or moving or adjusting that water and sewer infrastructure. The good thing is DOT, I think the, the new law requires that DOT, uh, DOT pay 50% of that. So we're not on the hook for all of it like we used to be. Um, so that is a good leverage of our money. Because that was going to be one of my questions is if, DO, if NCDOT requires you to do something, well, you're going to help us fund this as well. It's not all of it. but They, they, do, they do fund 50% of it. And, and some of it depends. If, um, you know, I'll just give you an example. If Gum Branch Road, we have a water line, and right now it's under the right-hand lane, um, coming from Rock Creek into city limits. For a portion of it's right outside of it, because as you can imagine, Gum Ranch is kind of two, three lane out near Rock Creek and widens out to four lane once you get to Summer Civil School Road. Well, in part of that, we're outside of the roadway. And in a portion of that, we're actually outside of the right of way, not just the roadway, the right of way. Um, we have easements. So, and then as you get closer into town, the road widens. We're actually under the roadway. Well, a lot of it depends on who was there first. So if our utility is there first, then they typically pick up the full expense of relocating it. If our utility is there 
and their roadway is there and they were put in roughly at the same time, which does happen because of development, then we have, you know, they have as much right to be there as we do. So we end up sharing the cost of that. So it's a, um, sometimes it's, it depends on whether we're in our own easement or is it something that we're in their roadway. So um, it does vary a little bit there. Um, as we're looking at programming projects into the capital improvement plan, especially for water and sewer, we look at our deteriorating infrastructure. Um, what I'll say, one of the um, blessed things about this city is we are not very old relative to cities. I mean, we, we are. We're, we're a fairly young city, um, not just by age demographic, by our own age, um, you know, most of our infrastructure, uh, especially water and sewer is 40s and newer, which when you compare that to other municipalities around the country, especially some of those that have had a lot of problems, their infrastructure is hundreds of years old. So matter of fact, there's a, a local municipality in the state um, that I know some of the people that work there and they actually have wooden pipes <laughs> in some of their municipality. Wow. So it's it's actually hauling out logs banded together. You so, may find when I suggest that now. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, but that just shows you what is out there in other municipalities. So we we really have a, you know, relatively speaking, a, a fairly young system, which does help us in materials. But that said, we have been through the periods where you use materials like asbestos, cement, some people refer to it as AC, um, which is a really good material as long as it stays wet. But if it dries out, it's gonna be brittle, it's gonna break and it's gonna crack and cause a lot of problems. Um, the, you know, we have um, old galvanized pipe that has lead joints. Um, you know, there's um, some copper out there. Um, we have thin wall tubing in our sewer system. We have truss pipe. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that, but it actually looks like a, it, if you look at it, it looks like it would be very sturdy. It's a, it's a pipe with an uh, outer pipe around it that has a honeycomb um, in between those that's had um, like grout pushed into it. So, Ironically, it's horrible. <laughs> it, it sounds like it'd be a very good material, but what happens is in that annular space between the inner pipe and the outer pipe, that grout breaks out and the pipe cracks and you actually get water from groundwater moving from um, outside the pipe to between the pipes that ends up causing pressure problems and, and further making the pipe brittle. Um, we hate truss pipe. There's... Mm -hmm quite a bit of it in the Northwoods area um, because a large portion of that was built out during um, some of that truss pipe period. So it's, you know, and then I think everybody's uh, pretty familiar with um, clay pipe. So we have a lot of clay pipe in our, in our waste water system and it's actually very good material. They still sell it as long as you don't break it or crack it or vibrate it a whole lot. So, um, you know, there's, you know, those are th things that we deal with, but we evaluate those. We camera our, our sewer system. We um, monitor our work orders and our water system. So we do identify those areas. And those are the areas that we go and we try to prioritize when we're talking about replacing um, deteriorated infrastructure. And we do that using mobile through and one. I'll show you a screenshot of that here in a few minutes. Um, then we watch development pressure, uh, like I, I talked about earlier. Um, anytime I talk to somebody that is even, even speculating on a piece of property, I take notes and we watch what they're proposing or talking about for that property. That I would say that probably 85 to 90% of the, the people we dis we discuss you know, potential developments or speculation on never comes to fruition. 
But what it does is it helps us look at the different types of projects that people are evaluating in areas. So it gives us a very good indication of whether we think that property would go residential or commercial. Um, and if it went residential, would it go multifamily or single family or, or something in between? You know, would it be an apartment complex or are we talking duplexes? So by tracking all of that information, um, it helps us, um, you know, become better prepared as things start moving into the window that we expect um, would develop. And I can tell you that there's property that I sat in on meetings on, you know, 15 years ago, and that property still hadn't developed. And there's properties that I sat in meetings on two years ago, and that thing's built out and finished. You just, you never know. Um, but this is why so, it's important for our representative to be on the planning board, because you can't remember to tell us everything. And the member that goes to the planning board can bring it back and let the board know what development is being talked about on the planning board. But as we're doing that, um, you know, we're maintaining those records and it helps us predict when we're saying, all right, what size lift station do we think we'll need in this area? How large is this basin? It may be a large basin, but we may not need, need as big of infrastructure in that area because it has a lot of wetlands or, you know, we think it'll develop out as residential instead of some high intense commercial. Um, so those are all things that we, we take into consideration. We plug those into our water and sewer models. We have both a water model and a wastewater model. Um, when Greg and Alden were here, we had the ability to maintain those in house. Unfortunately, when Alden left, we lost that capability and we haven't been able to fill that. So. When we need help, we do hire a consultant to help us. And um, right now, a, a, a consultant does house our model for us. Um, so we, we try to be very cautious about the scenarios we run. Uh, we only do that when we absolutely need to because it's not a cheap endeavor. Um, and then we use, we have several master plans um, that we use to, um, with our model evaluations and all of those other things that we've looked at, um, we have several master plans that we've put together to look at how we will serve um, future development. I talked about our work order system. This is a screenshot from Mobile 301. Um, over the last, well, this slide's probably about three or four months old now. But so if you go back three months and then the prior 12 months, um, you can see how many service repairs we've made just on water. Um, so we have 300 and we did 304 um, service leaks. So that's a leak between the main and the meter. Um, if it's behind the meter, it's on the customer side. That's not our responsibility. Um, but if it's between the meter and the main that's in the street, it's the city's responsibility. Um, and we, you know, over a, a 12 month period, we did 304 repairs. We had 35 water main breaks. So that would be a significant break that's in the street. Um, and those are typically emergency. So that means we go fix it that night. If, if we stay all night, we get it fixed that day. Um, and then we have, you know, different things that we do that we help metering and, and some others on. And then on the wastewater side, you can see the same thing on the sewer service we do. Um, that would be between the clean out and the main that's in the street. If it's behind the clean out, we don't count those because those are on the homeowner side. Um, and if we have a service backup where we have to go and what happens, we tell um, customers that if you have a backup in your <clears throat> sewer service, you can call us before you call a plumber. It doesn't mean we'll be able to take care of it or fix the problem, but we can tell you if the, if the problem is on our side of the clean out or on the homeowner side of the clean out. If we open a clean out and we can flush from the clean out to the main and the homeowner goes inside and flushes a toilet or runs a sink and we don't see any water come through, then obviously that responsibility is on the homeowner side and they'll need to call a plumber. But if the water's getting to the clean out and it just can't get from there to the main, then that falls on the city's responsibility. So we repair those. 
So if you look at those numbers um, and all those little dots that reflect that, you know, this is really a shout out for our utilities maintenance department and, and TJ, because if you look at those numbers, he does this with 14 people, I think. 14 people handle all of those repairs. Um, but we track all of them. So that tells us when he's, if he's constantly going into the same area, we need to go evaluate that and say, you know, we may need to do something more, which is how Brookview got added. That's how DeWitt Street got added. Um, so we do monitor those for continued deteriorating infrastructure. Um, just a, a slide of um, where we track, where we've been speaking with developers. I know you've seen this one a couple of times. Um, the vineyards is the um, development that's right there between um, Gum Branch Road and Western Boulevard. You can see that um, there was, um, it was zoned, the front part near Gum Branch was commercial, the back part was residential. And that's where, you know, from Dawkin to different owners over the, over time, that's what they thought, thought it would develop out at. Um, I haven't seen the final numbers, but that project is underway. Mr. Sides has cleared it. Um, Sides Construction has cleared it, and they're working on developing that property out. And then you can see we have a couple of other properties. Um, the one that showed that looks like an hourglass that has 68 lots. That one is not annexed into the city, but that's one that we've talked to that owner multiple times, and he foresees that coming into the city. It's right beside Carolina Forest. Actually, Carolina Forest stubs out into that property. But the 128 lots that you see across Ramsey Road, that property has been annexed. So... Um, and they've kind of started that project and backed off of it a couple of times. It's got some wetland challenges in it um, and stream crossings that they have to deal with, but we foresee that property coming in also. So these are all things that we take into consideration. One, one of the things that makes this a challenge is in the old days, the city could force annex outside the city limits. Now, you can't do that and the developer or the owners of that must request to be annexed. So it's really tough for Wally to know what's gonna happen unless he's talking to the developer. But again, in the old days it was, hey, the city thinks that should be in the city and they force annex it. And the legislation at the state level passed the thing saying you can't do that anymore. And the, the person that owns the land's gotta request it. And, Correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have to take it just because somebody requested it. No, somebody requested the decisions with city council. If somebody requests it, city council considers that at multiple hearings and then decides whether to accept it for annexation or not. Um, when, we, when we receive um, information, and I talked about how we get that programmed into a model, or into our model, and what that does, I know this is kind of hard to see, um, but this is just one of the, the same basins that I just showed you. You can see that um, originally that area that is the vineyards um, during this iteration wasn't really identified in the, you know, the, the portions that are shaded was the near term stuff. So that would have been basically less than uh, 20 years. Well, you can see that things change over time and you have things that you weren't planning on developing develop and things that, you know, the, the second circle that I have there um, is the 450 acres that city council purchased. So that was originally planned to come in because it was just the natural continuation of what uh, Williamsburg plantation, but now it's recreation. It was purchased to be recreation land. So while it'll develop, it'll be at a different use and we don't know the intensity yet, but I would expect that even under a recreation use, it would be a whole lot less on demand on water and sewer infrastructure than however, you know, 800 or 600 single family homes that could have been put on that same area. So um, those are all things that go into our model. And then you can see kind of the, um, 
as, it, as you move down, you see kind of dashed lines and yellow circles and red lines. Um, those are the, the model is flagging the sewer lines and telling us, hey, this is where you're going to have problems. This is where you need to go look, or this is what you need to get, figure out how to get around, or you're going to have to replace it. So, um, and then on top of that, the model can actually predict storm impacts too. So they'll look at wet weather flow. Um, so we can look at what a, um, you know, a hundred year storm could end up doing to our wastewater system because of I and I and those things. There are a lot of floors on that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, um, again, we, we've talked a little bit about this, but overall, what you will see upcoming in the, the CIP that we're starting to kick off, um, again, is the water and sewer projects, the expenditures, the years that we expect to expend money, um, the probable funding sources. Um, and then I think it's very important, Sabrina actually said this in hers, and I get to repeat it. The first year of the capital improvement plan is the only year that's funded. So the first year we kind of call the execution year because those are projects that we're actually executing. We have committed money to those. Um, the years two through 10 are really um, planning or, or forecast years. Those are, you know, those are projects that we anticipate on having to do. Um, and those, that's what we're, we're programming into our rate model. Um, and all of that information, again, with our operation budget, budget goes into the rate model for consideration. And, you know, I'll be, I'll be right up front and tell you, you know, my predictions for, I mean, not just mine, but staff as we're looking at projects, we're pretty solid on what we need to focus on this year. We're pretty solid on what we need to focus on next year. We do our best when we're talking 10 years out. I mean... It's kind of like trying to plan your own personal finances 10 years out, and we're trying to do it for an entire municipality. So we do our absolute best, but that's why we use tools that we have, um, like the model, to move projects around and adjust um, project timelines to try to level out our, our expenditures and our funding so that we don't put additional demand um, on the rate, the user rate, because... As Sabrina mentioned, that is the largest revenue stream into the water and sewer fund is the, the user rates that people pay monthly. Something for people to keep in mind with the CIP, yes, the current year is the execution year, but any project that you start that doesn't complete in that year is going to commit you into the later years. So you're looking at the second year, 90% of those projects may be already predisposed because you started them the year before and you've got to finish them. So it's really a small number of projects that you can start anew in the second or third year because you've got commitments for what you're doing right now. And those show up, you'll be able to, when you actually have a, a project sheet in front of you, those will be evident because when we fund <coughs> the project, um, because of state law, we fund, when, once you execute that contract, you have to have the money for the entire project that you've um, contracted for. So if it's a million dollar project and the million dollars will be spent over three years, if you look in the CIP, the expenditures will go out three years, but the funding source is all in the first year. So as we're programming projects, that's something else that we try to keep in consideration also. Um, now, it, what you will see is if we start design, just because you started design does not mean you committed to that project to construct it. So we may start a design and if it's not ready to go to, and that's what happened with the Western Regional, um, we completed design, we actually completed design, got all the permits, got all the easements and said, you know, we're really not ready to go out to bid for this project yet. So we, we held on to it. And that project's been designed so long, we've actually extended the, the permits at least once, maybe twice in some cases. 
Um, so we do, even, even if it does have some money committed to it, we still evaluate that project every year. Um, and then this is just the, the summary slide for the timeline so you know what to expect. Tonight we kind of gave you a, a overview of what the capital improvement program is, what type of projects go into it, what you can expect to see, um, and then at your next meeting um, in January, and if we don't have it ready for you then it would certainly be the one in February, we will do a project update. So everything that we are currently working on that is a water and sewer capital project, we will bring to you, we'll give you an update on it, tell you where we stand. Uh, and then from there, we will talk about the, the draft CIP, we will bring it to you. We try to bring it to you over multiple meetings. So it's not like you have to review everything all at once. Um, and then what we do typically, once we get closer to the typically ends up being in the, you know, April time frame. We, we start looking for a recommendation to city council of support of the capital improvement projects uh, for water and sewer. So with that, I don't have anything else. Well, to me, this was all very uh, fascinating. I mean, we learned a lot of these briefs and I just read a lot more appreciation to your models because that kind of like does the work no matter what's asked of you. You've got it plugged in and you, you've got the work, you know, halfway done on that. But um, now again, we appreciate the briefs and it's always very informative, not just to us, but to everybody watching. Um, does anybody here have any other questions of the briefers? Did you mention you had other approvals or something you needed for the Western region? So what, um, Yes, we have been working with the state to get final approval so we can bid it out using the ARPA funds. The, while, while the grant funding was very nice and very appreciated, it came with a whole lot of extra approvals. Um, in some cases, we're actually having to go back and get something that we already have approved, pre-approved. So it's, um, the, and it, in all honesty, it's fairly common with state projects. If you remember the water treatment plant project, we didn't have grant funds on that, but we used state um, revolving fund or something uh, from public water supply, and they had to approve everything. I mean, including the documents we use, the forms, the pay applications, everything. So we've had, they've had it for, um, at least eight months, maybe close to a year now, and we're, we're trying to get that project approved. So um, we could go to construction tomorrow with it. The problem is we couldn't use the funds because it hasn't, you know, it hasn't been reviewed and approved. But they, they literally go all the way down to the MBE forms, the minority business participation forms that we use and everything. So it's a very intensive review. Two questions about the master plans for water and sewer. The current ones were done when and when will it be the redone? What year will we have uh, new master plans? The one we're working off of for wastewater is probably, um, it was probably developed six or eight years ago. Um, but it's been kind of updated with notes and stuff from staff. I don't know. I think um, the appropriate time would probably be, you know, the, the major component of that plan is the Western Regional. So we really haven't, you know, we're starting to see the growth that it projected and we're starting to see um, the projects that it projected. So once we get the, that growth and that projects behind us, it's probably about time to go out and to do another wastewater master plan. Water, the water master plan is actually older than that, um, but water does not change as much, um, but primarily because the usage, um, you know, the per person usage has actually gone down significantly over the years, and that's largely attributable to energy-efficient appliances. 
Um, so we are, um, you know, we use our model to tell us where we need to extend pipes for development and those kind of things. And, and the wastewater, I mean, the water model really is fulfilled for the next, um, at least at this rate, the next 20 to 25 years, because our wastewater, I mean, our water treatment plants expandable to 8 million gallons a day. And our average daily uses is, usage is somewhere around 4.3. So we have plenty of water capacity. It's just making sure you have pipes in the right places to, to serve water. So the water is in really good shape. Um, the, the wastewater master plan, um, as we see some of this development continue, which it included some of the public's area. And, um, you know, it, it takes property a long time to develop out. So I would guess after we get the Western Regional system constructed and we start seeing the vineyards truly build out with houses on the ground and not rolling, I think it'll probably be about time to update that again. And the master plans are done in-house or do you contract those? We contract those out. And they're expensive? They are. Thank you. All right, are there any further questions? Hearing none, in closing, uh, our next uh, scheduled meeting is uh, 5.30 p.m. Thursday, January 12th, 2023. Uh, if there are no other business, I'd like to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And uh, yes, sir? Can we do one, one more? Just some one pictures. More. Okay. Um, Derek manages our asset management plan, which uh, is what maintains our elevated storage tanks and um, we just finished the highway 17 tank so this was largely attributed to Derek and his work um, you can see the left side the picture on the left side is what the tank looked like and the picture on the right is after it's all completed so this tank is located right beside Jacksonville station so if you so is that Derek on the right side? <laughs> Out there installing. <laughs> so it's a, um, we just wanted to kind of highlight that because, you know, we have these under an asset management program. So, and this is one that we just brought under. So um, while it looks very nice, it's important to maintain these assets. And not only did they do the outside, they did the inside also. And also some valve and piping work right outside the, the water tank. Yeah, they put an anti-freeze uh, valve on top there. That's what the, the little satellite dish looking thing on top is. Now the anticipated life cycle of that tank now is what? For, life cycle? Yeah, if uh, we have to do something again. They will, they're under contract to, they'll, they'll come back every year and do um, an inspection an evaluation of both the exterior and um, interior uh, of the tank and then they get repainted um i think once every ten. Ten, is it 10 years yeah. every, every 10 years oh what and they do is to their their own contract so if they come out and they identify there's a problem with the coating they go ahead and touch it up then so you don't have the way we before we got these under asset management the way it worked is Staff would go out there, go up there and do an evaluation, and we really couldn't do the coatings. So if we noted something, we kind of just noted it every year, and then when we actually had to do something, it was much more expensive. It, so they they maintain the coating for us too, but the contract calls for two paintings, I believe, one when we put it under, and then one at ten years. And it's more than just paint too. Like for this particular tank, they, they did some concrete work down at the footing too. Um, so, you know, where, where those uh, support structures come down on those concrete, you know, there was some uh, deterioration there that they they, they fixed up with, with concrete. So it, it's more than uh, well, just we what you get a brief saying these towers were good for 50 years or less renovated or less retrograded, something improve but uh, they shouldn't rot in less than 50 years or become brittle or anything they're like 50 year um i don't know oh. 
I, I as long I mean, as long as you maintain them, they ought to last indefinitely. So mm -hmm. I'm sure. I mean, everything's got a, a lifespan, but mm -hmm. the the importance there is to continue to maintain that coating and maintain. They're not like a, a car, you know. If you if you don't maintain a car, you know, it's even not going to last you twenty years. Even if you do, it won't. <laughs> yeah. So it, you know, we're they come in and, and completely, and it's a special coating that they use. Well, and with that, uh, I noticed here we have an open discussion. Everybody want to continue discussion, uh, discuss anything else that we've missed. I think that was it. All right. I think then again, uh, our next meeting will be the 12th of January, 2023. And again, wishing everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I will accept the motion to adjourn. So then. Second. Second. All right. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.